Thank you very much. I am delighted to uh, add my welcome to you all for what I think should be a very interesting afternoon of uh, evidence, and we hope action by the end of the afternoon as well. Uh, I think it's quite unique for us to be able to step into this space. Uh, it's such an important issue in terms of global poverty, and uh, one on which really five years ago there was so little very rigorously established evidence. Uh, and so we'll be, I'll be giving kind of an overview talk now, uh, and then you'll be seeing detailed presentations from a number of the leaders in this field uh, who, who are coming from the field with really uh, meaningful and important policy results. So what I'd like to do is just give a, a, a bit of a more detailed overview of a tie first. Uh, I'd like to try to summarize some of the project areas in which we feel that we now have a good enough concentration of evidence to be able to make some policy conclusions. And then uh, I'd like to close by kind of posing a few questions that I think will be coming up during the course of the day and then will be uh, picked up and amplified by uh, Elan and the panel that will take place at the end of the day today. So, in a sense, the core thing we're here to talk about is really the issue of cereal yields in sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, the cereal yields per hectare have increased by over 150% over the past 50 years in the developed world and have remained almost unchanged in sub-Saharan Africa on average over that period. There are some countries that have seen improvements, some countries that have seen deterioration. Um, so basically all of the improvement in overall productivity in cereals in sub-Saharan Africa has come from extensification over the course of this period. Now extensification is in some sense a strategy that has run its course. The, the, the latitude for that to continue to expand food production is over. Uh, it is unsustainable from a land perspective, it's unsustainable from an environmental perspective, and of course we now find ourselves in a position where most of the really fertile areas of sub-Saharan Africa are now seeing rapidly decreasing average plot sizes as high, uh, high fertility intersects with a fixed land size, and so farm sizes are falling quite fast. So the sense here is that the, the day of extensification has ended, the moment for intensification has come, and so now the question becomes how can this be achieved? So when we're trying to understand understand this lack of improvement in yields, it's a picture from the WDR, which uh, Alan was uh, in charge of from, from 2008. So this is basically showing that even when compared to other developing regions of the world, that we have this very, very low use of irrigation, of improved varieties of seeds, and of fertilizers in sub-Saharan Africa. And so the point here really is, uh, there's scope, right? There's plenty of scope to be able to improve yields. These are not novel technologies. This is not some kind of unknown technological space that we have to try to pioneer in. It's very well known how this can be done. The question is, how do you get people to move into this space in an environment where adoption is so low? So. The research agenda here I can, I can divide sort of loosely into three phases, and, and this is basically kind of cataloging the intellectual evolution of a tie over the course of time. So the first phase really is interested in the question of adoption. We know what technologies work, we know they aren't being used. So in a sense, the, the, the first order question is, why is it that people are not taking these technologies up, and what are the interventions that can be effective in getting them to use things like fertilizer, improved seeds, et cetera? So then phase two, which is I think where we find ourselves now, is that once we've gone through this initial phase of projects and we've kind of seeded uh, uh, policy studies in a very large variety of areas, that now we start to see some really promising modalities coming down the pipeline. We start to understand that here are some very effective ways of promoting adoption. And now the question becomes, it, given that we know how to create adoption in certain contexts, what are the downstream impacts of improving input use? Okay, so the real impacts, the final thing we care about, household income, children malnutrition, things along these lines, right? So, so the deep outcomes that are critical from a welfare perspective, but are also very hard to measure, they're subtle and they tend to need big studies to be able to pick them up from a statistical power perspective. So this is basically what the current wave of funding that we're engaging in now is trying to kind of double down resources behind these projects that have been shown to be successful in the, in the, in the adoption phase. Can we really track out these final impacts? What is the link? between improving productivity and improving welfare. And I guess a large part of what we want to be talking about today is that that link is less obvious than it seems like it might be. So then phase three then is, what are these deeper impediments and what are the reasons that that link may not be so clear? That in other words, we've come up with a way to make yields go up, but yields rise and welfare doesn't improve. Why would that be? Is that a part of the underlying problem? So this is an issue that we'll be re re uh, re returning to recurrently during the course of the afternoon. So. 
uh, you know, talking a bit about the Agricultural Technology and Adoption Initiative, a tie has already been introduced by, uh, by Temina. So uh, we are grateful to funding from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, from DFID, and from an anonymous donor that has allowed us to make uh, 31 field projects uh, funded through a tie. Very large expansion in the number of top research and researchers in development economics who are worry, working in this area. And really, I think, quite a dramatic expansion in the, in the evidence base of rigorous experiments experimental evidence uh, on interventions in this policy space. So let me just go through a few slides talking about uh, what's happening with the tie and, and, and kind of uh, what our progress has been. So here's a map that uh, shows you basically the distribution of projects in two dimensions. One of them is spatially, and then the other one is across the seven areas that we've defined as being the critical behavioral constraints to adoption. So we have credit markets, information, input output inefficiencies, externalities, risk markets, labor inefficiencies, and land inefficiencies. So as you will see from uh, the numbers behind those and from the colors, we've done better in some areas than others. Uh, we've not had a lot of studies come through the door that are on labor inefficiencies or land inefficiencies. We're pushing very hard now into input output questions because that's been, I think, identified both intellectually and from policy terms as being kind of the, the, the critical necessary condition that if we can't establish those linkages, it's very hard to make the connection all the way through to welfare. Uh, so Temina already touched on some of these numbers, 42 total awards, 31 unique Atai projects, uh, 84,000 people surveyed, 7,800 people whose behavior has changed. And then I think, uh, you know, an important thing here is that we've got 64 top researchers who have come in and worked on uh, agriculture as a result of a tie funding. So this is the list of all of the PIs who've been funded through a tie. The names in bold are people who had never worked on agricultural issues before a tie was uh, created. So not to claim causality where it may not exist, but uh, I, I think uh, by looking at some of those bolded names, you'll see that we've really included in the agricultural research base some of the top economists in the world uh, through the Atai initiative. That was correlation, by the way, not causality. All right, so um, just to give a list of partners, so we've involved over 50 partners, and of course, uh, you know, it's not necessarily the case that academics are the best people to be defining the interventions, right? We work with, with implementers not just because they can get the work done on the ground, but because they're the ones who have that practical experience, they see what is necessary, they understand the clientele far better than we do, and their ideas of what are important and what are critical are, are an, a, a, an absolutely essential piece of the way that we mutually define projects and research questions with our with our collaborating institutions so I think really an incredible diversity of institutions with whom we've collaborated uh, just to give a few specific examples to drill down so so to talk about some of the SEGA collaborations we're going to be hearing later in the in the keynote about uh, the one acre fund so this is an organization that has served over 130,000 farmers last year uh, improving annual household income by over 50 percent and on target to scale to over 300,000 farmers by 2015. Uh, we have representatives here from the International Rice Research Institute. Uh, there's been a very strong collaboration between SEGA researchers and, and ERI looking at the Swarna Sub-1 variety. You'll see some of that evidence presented today. So this is a varietal, a varietal that has now been introduced to over 5 million farmers in Asia. Uh, and then there's a very strong research collaboration between SEGA and BRAC, which as I'm sure you know is one of the largest NGOs in the world. 700,000 students in BRAC schools, two and a half million people getting training on hygiene and sanitation. Uh, and so, you know, the scope that we have to really work at scale by working with such great collaborators is, is obviously uh, tremendously expanded. We held a matchmaking workshop uh, a year ago in Berkeley, which was based on trying to bring together implementers that were trying novel things in the field and wanted to be able to establish rigorous evidence on those with researchers who were looking for uh, new opportunities to do projects on the ground. So this is a kind of a uh, scattershot picture of, of uh, logos of different organizations that participated in that matchmaking uh, workshop. It's a very well-run workshop, and we have now a number of funded Atai projects that are in the field that resulted from this workshop. 
uh, this is a schematic of kind of the growth of the evidence base. Uh, obviously, one of the difficult things with funding long-term, uh, uh, you know, ex-ante studies is that the money goes out the door long before the results come in. So these are basically projects that are in the field, have already essentially been paid for and are now doing follow-up surveys. So this is essentially showing we're really only halfway through the pipeline of the results that are going to be coming in just off of the funding wave that we already have. Uh, we're here in 2014, and so then we're working our way up to the, the results conference that reports the final outcomes from the first wave of funding in early 2017. So as I said before, we've had somewhat uneven progress in terms of uh, uh, where we've seen a lot of studies come in. This has something to do with the intellectual questions that people are asking, and it also has something to do with the methodology in the sense that, for example, uh, land markets may be less amenable to RCTs than information. So it's really credit markets, risk markets, and information where we've seen a large density of studies, and we feel that we're now in the position to be able to reach some conclusions at a, at a broader level. So I want to talk about each of those three independently, and then. Uh, uh, you know, in a sense, more to come on the others. There's also a very nice new study from the World Bank on, on land market. So let me talk first about information. So I want to reiterate something that Temina said, which is that one of the huge benefits of RCTs is they tell you things don't work. Uh, in this, this massive industry of M&E, of monitoring evaluation that takes place in the, develop, in the development world, right? I mean, there's, the problem is that you can sort of always figure out a way of cooking your counterfactuals and your outcomes in a manner that appears to make everything work well, and implementers love these results, and there's been a lot of positive results in development, and there's obviously still a lot of poverty out there. So, I mean, we really feel that one of the core contributions that this methodology has is to say clearly what doesn't work. And so I really want to try to highlight those areas where we seem to have come back with a fairly conclusive set of non-results on specific interventions. So. In terms of information, to start with an obvious thing, but it is, it is uh, something that is important to demonstrate, basically if you're coming out and trying to train people on things, the effect of a training has everything to do with what they learn. And so if you're coming to a group of farmers and giving them extension advice on crops that they have farmed for years using inputs that they have a lot of experience with, it is very, very difficult in that environment to be able to provide information that enhances their productivity because they know what they're dealing with. So, uh, th th another version of the same thing is if you have farmers whose fundamental problem is that the constraint on them receiving higher prices is market power that is held by intermediaries, then simply coming to them and telling them what the prices are in other markets or in the capital city is ineffective because their problem is not a lack of knowledge, it's a lack of power relative to these, these very strong intermediaries. Right? So these are, in a sense, kind of two versions of the same story, which is that information is only powerful insofar as it is both novel and actionable. So where can we look for places that we find novel and actionable inter information interventions? So first of all, can we come up with ways of doing informational interventions Interventions that actually shift the market power of intermediaries. Okay, so thinking about the intermediaries as being people who basically squat on the center of markets, exploit imperfect information as a way of gaining informational rents, how can you build conduits that are short-circuiting that and allowing buyers and sellers to communicate directly? There's a lot of technological options to do this. Uh, secondly, if information is being provided about new technologies, there's much more scope for it to have an effect because you're now teaching them about something that they don't know about, okay? So new farming practices, such as seaweed farming, new types of pesticides and fertilizers that they may not have a lot of experience with and that the immediate visual evidence from their plants is not highly informative. We have some very clean studies showing that you can actually get people to use less pesticide and increase yields and increase profits. And in fact, when people are using new varietals, it's even more critical that new technology may in fact have a negative effect without training. So it's really to say that when we introduce new things, it's critical to bring along with that, the information that allows people to capitalize on these newly created opportunities. The final area that I think we've seen a lot of positive effects around informational interventions are where there is some story about behavioral problems that things like procrastination or time inconsistency are preventing people from engaging in activities that they may know are important, but they're not salient or they're inconvenient, and there are reasons that they're not doing that. And so, for example, sending text reminders to people to get them out to do things that it is easy for them to procrastinate. These are very time-sensitive activities in terms of the agricultural cycle, and so timely 
nudges to get them to do things that are really important at that moment in the crop cycle can be effective in terms of improving yields. So our final issue here I think is we need to think always about profits and not yields. It is very easy to get yourself into, into a position where you start thinking of improving yields as being the final goal. If you have interventions that are either extremely labor intensive or input intensive, it's really not that interesting to know that you can improve yields on your farm by working three times as hard. You have to have some concept of the opportunity cost of time and really think about, is this improving profits for the farmer? Because if it's not, adoption will not be sustained. All right, on insurance, I think we have Quite, a, quite an important negative result here. There's been a lot of excitement around index insurance, including, unfortunately, for myself. Uh, so so th the idea here is that farmers are very good at smoothing risks that are idiosyncratic, but they have a very difficult time dealing with these big correlated shocks that come from weather risk. So the, the hypothesis is that if I can build an, a, a derivative or an insurance product that is just picking off that correlated piece that comes from weather, there should be a huge demand for this and there should be a very large welfare gain. So this is kind of the best idea that hasn't worked in development economics over the course of the last five years. There's a fairly clear takeaway here that if you charge market prices with commercial premiums on the insurance, there is not sufficient demand for these products to make them work. Okay, this is, stands in sharp distinction to microfinance, to micro savings products. These are products that have logic in some sense, both for the lender and the, the client. And here we're seeing that really the logic is not there. Okay, so, so uh, this is pushing the emphasis now in a number of different directions. One of which is to say, if there's still fundamental logic in this idea, maybe I need to be moving to a meso level or a macro level, rather than trying to provide insurance directly down to the farmer where their demand is the critical salient issue, if there's a financial institution that's newly extending credit that is heavily exposed to weather risk, is there a role for a derivative for that institution to protect its portfolio? If you have state governments, as in the case of Agoras MX in Mexico, that are providing a backstop, a safety net to their citizens, is there a role that, that index insurance can play at that macro level, right? So it's not to say we give up on the idea, it's to say there's a modality that we have clear evidence is not sustainable at a market level, and so is there a new way of, of, of conceptualizing this? Now, Something that's a little bit more speculative, but I think it's quite interesting, is this is idea. So there's a, there's a paper, uh, a Mubarak and Rosenzweig paper, showing that where you get index insurance to work, there's this tendency for people to actually increase their exposure to weather-related risk, right? That's kind of the premise of a financial service. It allows you to take on more weather-related risk. This is higher, higher expected value and higher variance. So what happens when you come in with a financial instrument is you actually increase the total exposure of farming in an area to weather volatility. Now this is fine for the farmer because the farmer is protected by the financial product, but this is a huge welfare cost to rural laborers who are truly the poorest of the poor. These are the landless, right? So now these people don't have the financial instrument. They are workers in agricultural markets that have become more volatile as the result of the use of this financial instrument, and therefore wages co-move more with weather than they would have without the insurance product. So I think the excitement now that's coming up is the idea that we also have crops that have the mechanical property of decreasing responsiveness to weather risk. So there's a sense in which the crop and the financial institution look similar to each other, they look like substitutes, and yet the use of crops that are weather, let's say drought resistant, will structurally decrease the exposure of output to weather volatility, and therefore uh, in, in some sense may have this effect of both protecting farmers and laborers. And then finally to talk about credit, you know, credit is a highly variable thing and, 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 and very context specific. So I, I hesitate to make any uh, externally valid statements about credit, but I'll, I'll try to point out a few results. So first of all, evidence from uh, Ethiopia, Morocco, and Mali that, that indeed ag activity and profits do seem to increase when access to credit is expanded. Uptake is not very high, indicating that there are other constraints, but it does look as if relaxing this constraint can have an effect. Um, Quite a bit of evidence, again, tying back to the earlier results that uh, financial literacy training may not be effective. People already know these things, so training them on it is not effective. Collateralizing of assets looks like it may be a promising way of moving forward, especially in agriculture. And then thinking very carefully about the timing of loans in agriculture, which you'll see uh, some, some work this afternoon based on this idea. 
when do people sell, when do people buy, when are prices high, when are prices low, and that this opens up this very unique and special opportunity to create welfare benefits with credit. So in terms of moving forward, I'll just conclude with a couple of ideas. You know, we have you know, a population in Africa expected to quadruple over the next 90 years. 40% of children on the continent are already stunted or malnourished. So despite the fact that we've had a lot of success in, in terms of these kinds of uh, high value light crops being exported, really the, the, the food insecurity situation is about cereals and this is where we need to think. So we have this issue that cereal markets tend to be very localized. This leads to poor co-integration of markets across space, large fluctuations in price within seasons and steep demand curves. And so I think the learning agenda that we'll be talking about this afternoon is, you know, how can we think about spatial integration? What are the interventions around transport or information that may be able to help flatten out some of these spatial contours? How can we think about the intertemporal variation? What are some of the assets around storage or credit that may be able to smooth out price fluctuation within a season in a given market? And then finally, what are the linkages between uh, these very steep demand curves and the incentive to enhance productivity at all? If I know that by increasing productivity, I will drive prices down. Does this serve as a barrier to people adopting? And the idea here is the supply chain is really a supply loop. When I see that my output will affect my price, this fundamentally alters my incentives to increase output. So let me leave it there and we'll move on to detailed research presentations.